Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's session. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to the session, How to Build Trust in User-Centric Digital Public Services. We're happy that you're joining us here today for this day zero event to kick off the Internet Governance Forum 2023. For all those people joining, please come in, find a seat. My name is Christopher Newman. I'm an advisor at the German Agency for International Cooperation, GIZ, working in the field of digital governance, and I will be your on-site moderator today. A brief note on housekeeping and what we plan to cover in the next hour or so. Our session is being held in hybrid format, as you can see, and will be a roundtable discussion followed by an open question and answer session. After hearing from our panelists, two of whom are here at the top of the table, two of whom are joining us virtually. We encourage the audience, that's all of you here in this room and all those joining from around the world, to get involved in the discussion. For all participants joining us via Zoom, please keep your microphones muted for the duration of the session. I believe your microphones are automatically muted, so that makes things easier. And you are encouraged to post questions to our panelists in the chat at any time. So if you have a question burning uh, um, to get off your chest, please feel free to post it in the chat and we will pick it up in the Q&A. This session is organized by the German Federal Ministry for Digital and Transport together with GIZ. The German Ministry for Federal, uh, Federal Ministry for Digital and Transport engages in digital dialogues with several key countries, partner countries around the world to shape better framework conditions for the digital transformation of our governments, economies, and societies. As a multi-stakeholder initiative, the digital dialogues provide a platform for direct exchange between policymakers, regulators, businesses, and civil society. The goal of this session here today is to share lessons in implementing trustworthy and user-centric digital public services and to explore the role of data governance and AI in building trust. Now, before we jump in and I hand over to our moderators, uh, sorry, to our speakers, a few words on what we're going to talk about here today. In today's digital era, citizens increasingly expect government services to be convenient and easily accessible across channels, devices, and platforms. They have the potential to meet citizens' demands and be more responsive, improve service delivery, and transform how citizens are engaging with their governments. Underpinning the success of these new digital public services is the aspect of trust. Citizens must feel confident that their personal data is handle handled responsibly and that digital public services are reliable and secure. This then in turn raises important questions around what data governance frameworks must be put in place, how to drive the adoption of services through user-centered design, and how AI can be leveraged responsibly to unlock possibilities for automation and personalization in a way that boosts efficiency while also maintaining trust. To help unpack some of these complex issues, we have a panel of four esteemed speakers with a wealth of experience on this topic, representing four different country perspectives. I would like to introduce them to you. First off, here in the room, we have Dr. Rudolf Griedel, um, Director General of the Central Department at the German Federal Ministry for Digital and Transport. In this role, he's responsible for advancing the digitalization in his administration. His ministry also coordinates across the government on Germany's digital and data strategies. Previously, he headed the Department of International Digital Policy at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Next, moving to the online world, we are happy to have joining us virtually from Kyiv, Valeria Yonan. Valeria is the Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Digital Transformation in Ukraine, where she oversees Ukraine's national digital literacy program, development and growth of SMEs and entrepreneurship, regional digital transformation, as well as Euro integration and international relations. Back in this room, we have Dr. Luana Roncaracci, I hope I pronounced that okay, who serves as Deputy Secretary of Digital Government at the Brazilian Ministry of Management and Innovation in Public Services. Luana is responsible for coordinating the digital transformation of the federal administration, 
as well as developing Brazil's national strategy of digital government in cooperation with states and municipalities. Last but, but not least, online we have joining us Gotam Ravichander, who is head of strategy at the eGov Foundation in India. Over the past 20 years, the eGov Foundation has developed and implemented digital solutions for city and state administrations across India to develop accessible, affordable, and inclusive e-services. Gotam previously led eGov's policy initiatives with the government of India and partner states. Welcome to you all. Now, without further ado, let's jump straight into our discussion. We will start off with a lightning round, and I would like to ask each participant to briefly, in a one minute or so, share your thoughts on the following question. What do you see as the biggest challenge in building trust in digital government? And please stick to the time allotted so I don't have to be rude and cut you off. And we're going to start uh, with Gotam. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christopher. So what I'm going to say is going to sound a little simple, but it has to work. It has to work reliably, transparently, on time, every time. That is unfortunately not the experience of many people in many parts of the world in much of recent history, right? So it's not just citizens who need to see this working, it's even government leaders and government officials who need to see these systems working. They have to believe that these systems work, they deliver transparency, they deliver services, they deliver benefits, and they make life easier for everyone involved. Otherwise, and they do not impinge on sovereignty. Otherwise, they will not even initiate such efforts, especially in much of the developing world. The other element is in much of the world, it's not really going to be pure digital government. We're going to have what we call digital government, which is a portmanteau of physical and digital. You need humans in the loop, people who will actually work with citizens on the ground because they have trust face to face and enable them to access the digital world. So I think this is going to be important, making sure that the seamless experience of digital government is something that everybody experiences for trust to start building. Gautam, thank you very much. Uh, I learned a new word there, uh, fidgetal. I'm not sure about you. I've heard of phablet uh, for the phone slash tablet, but fidgetal is a good word in integrating uh, digital and physical. Um, I'd like to hand uh, the word over to Dr. Greedel. What do you see as the biggest challenge of building trust in digital government? Yeah, actually, uh, thank you very much, Christopher, and uh, welcome to everybody. From my side, actually, uh, much uh, in the same direction, I think um, the services have to be um, user-friendly and um, reliable at the same time. This is sometimes a challenge. Um, the more we get into um, user friendliness and uh, customer experience, the less sometimes we have to, we, have to we, we are able to respect uh, data protection and security issues. So there has to be a trade off, but uh, for the people to first of all use these services, they have to work, they have to be convenient, they have to be um, in place every time, everywhere. And uh, this is something that we are experiencing in Germany. Uh, if, this is, if this is not uh, the case, um, you can build a very secure and a very data protective um, framework. Um, people won't use it. Uh, so I think that's the most important um, challenge and my minute is over. <laughs> Thank you um, very much, Dr. Griedel. Um, Valeria, over to you. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Well, I would like to dig a little bit deeper. So I would start with another question. And what is trust? And what does it mean to trust? And when trust happens by default? Can it really happen by default? And I think you will agree with me that this is the complex question for just one minute. So Chris, please don't be rude to me, but probably I will need 30 seconds more. So however, I like one of the definitions that trust is confidence in the appropriateness of actions of a certain stakeholder without a need of actualizing such confidence on a regular basis. And this is great definitions to my mind leads us to some very important conclusions. First of all, institutional trust is very important. Secondly, therefore, one of the basic requirements of trust is security. And thirdly, when it comes to digital government, sometimes there might be no correlation between electronic transparency and trust in government. So what to do about it? I think we have a lot to discuss uh, uh, too during today's session. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Valeria, and thank you for uh, sticking to the time as well. Finally, to round us off in the lightning round, uh, Luana. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me. And I'm going directly to the point. Well, from our point of view, we believe that one of the big biggest challenges that we have is the, the siloed and fragmented model of providing public services. I think it uh, uh, impacts a lot the way how uh, service delivery uh, is done today. And it comes from the traditional bureaucratic model that it w used to be uh, uh, defined by the the way uh, government uh, is organized and not in the way people deserve and, and uh, demand services, public services. And by investing in centralized tools and platforms, we are trying to advance towards a, a whole of government approach. And uh, we've been discussing and defining and providing tools such as the single window portal, GovBR, the national digital ID uh, with uh, hundreds of millions of people that already have the, the .br account, the digital signature, and mainly also that we have a lot to do, a lot of work ahead of us to do, that is the interoperability platform and that it, the idea is to, to integrate thousands of SIFs as well. And I finished my time, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Luana. So what do we take away from the lightning round? Um, we heard a definition of trust and the complexity of what does it even mean to have trust in these digital public services. We heard the issue of path dependency, um, of how public services were provided in the past, the fragmentation and silo that uh, make it difficult to um, shift to a digital mindset. And we heard about output legitimacy that it has to work first and foremost, and each of us as citizens of our respective jurisdictions um, have experienced that, that it feels good when things work. Now, let us dive into more depth, and I would like to now um, hear perspectives from the panelists on a few different aspects of this, of trust in digital public services. Gotham, starting with you. India has created a tech stack for the entire country of 1.4 billion people, and your organization supports governments in building platforms for better service delivery. What have you learned from working with digitalization with various levels of government in India, and what factors matter most in fostering trust between governments and citizens? Sure. Thanks for that, Christopher. I think uh, I'm just going to go back quickly to recap my previous answer. It has to work reliably. Now, this is not the software alone, right? It's the government and the whole process of delivering services and benefits to citizens. So for this, we have to really focus on capacity. Capacity can mean many things, right? At the front line, you know, field employees get the information that they need and they are able to perform the tasks they have to do in a very time-bound manner. Administrators can manage their resources, human, financial, and the performance of these resources to address the issues that they're coming up with. And ideally speaking, they should be able to spot and preempt crises before they happen. Uh, policymakers should be able to track uh, progress on goals and use the system to have greater confidence that the policy as intended is actually going to translate into execution on the ground. And Somewhere in the midst of all of this, you need someone who's able to actually deploy and ma manage systems, right? Now, on this, I will say that when those capacities for technology development and maintenance are not put in government, it, that can be contracted in and partnered with. But you cannot get away from the capacity needs at the field levels, the administrator levels, and the policymaker levels. So focusing on building those capacities, especially at the local government level, is going to be important because that's the interface between human beings and uh, the government itself, right? The second thing really comes down to focusing on making and keeping promises, right? Uh, SLA is a promise that I will deliver X service. It could be something as simple as applying for a trade license or running a shop, and I will get it in why time and it will happen without any issues or they were uh, with a certain amount of quality all levels that i described in the previous part have to align to make this happen so when we are defining these timelines and we're defining these promises as garments to citizens we have to ensure that they are promises that can be kept they are re realistic so there's no point promising that a road will get fixed overnight if the local government does not have the financial manpower uh, resources and the manpower to ensure those fixes can happen. This also needs to be paired with the need of transparency. So as a citizen, 
can you see the status of any request you've made, where it is sitting? Is it delayed? Is it auto escalated? Can you request escalations? Are you able to get into the details of what is happening without having to walk into a garment office? That clarity actually is important more than just the timeliness, just transparency so that I know where my files are being processed, what's going on with my application goes a long way to increasing trust. Otherwise, typically we are all used to a non-functional garment systems really looking at sites that say it's in process and that's it. We don't know anything else and we don't know how long it will take. So focus on giving more granular information to citizens. The third piece really comes back to focusing on security and privacy. Now, this is a digital panel. There is always a lot of conversation about technology, encryption, mattering, uh, things like privacy by design. But a lot of the real gains will really come from process reforms. So for example, a field engineer who is servicing a water connection request does not need to know every single piece of information about the person who's made that request. They just need to know the information required to perform their function. So re-educating them and providing them with that information in a way that they can deliver that uh, service to the citizen, as well as ensuring that on the back end, the various pieces of information that uh, are required to provide that service, for example, verifying your identity, very, uh, collecting your payments, uh, possibly even verifying your property records can be done digitally without having to constantly rely on human beings passing the files. Uh, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that oh, we send files as PDFs. It means that you can query systems through APIs and if somebody says, hey, I am Gautam Ravi Chandra and I live in uh, place X, that is something that an API can verify and it will go back and say, yes, Gotham is who he says he is. And by the way, he does stay at the place he says he stays at. So you can go ahead and provide him that water connection. So in that way, to a certain manner, you'll aut automatically start building in purpose limitation by reforming processes and minimizing data collection straight into workflows. I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gautam. Very um, important um, fundamental points uh, you raised there. Um, returning here to uh, the physical aspect of the digital space we're uh, moving in, uh, Dr. Griedel, Germany is known for being a champion of data protection and data privacy. What role do robust data governance frameworks play in building trust in digital public services? Yes, thank you. Actually, it's true that we are a country of data protection, huge country uh, data protection tradition. We have uh, even a constitutional right for informational self-determination that has been created by our constitutional court in the 80s, very early in the process. And uh, data protection is very dear to the heart of Germans. So if you uh, regularly do surveys uh, amongst the Germans, they will say, yeah, data protection in, in relation uh, to, to state and to companies, it's very, very high on the agenda. If you look at the behavior in day-to-day -day lives, you see uh, quite a different picture because um, as long as it is um, for the private sector, people are willing to share data and provide data to larger companies, to platforms and so forth, not so much to the state. So all, this, all, the, all the official um, channels um, are still um, yeah, are still a little bit mistrusted. Uh, what, what do they do with my data? So it, it plays a, a huge role um, for the acceptance of services that uh, you can credibly argue your data is secure. And it's not only the security, it's also the data protection, meaning um, if we collect any data from the citizen, we will only collect it for the purpose that um, we are saying that we are collecting it and we are not going to um, match it with, I don't know, other, other data files. Like we are not going to match the health, the health record with uh, the employment record or things like that. So um, which, um, which makes things much more difficult for the administration. Because it would be much easier if we had you know, all these, um, these, these data files together at one place. But we do not, as, as you were saying, Gotham, uh, we, we need a transparent process and a transparent administration. We, at the same time, do not want a, pr uh, a transparent citizen uh, that, that, that the state knows every everything about. So um, I, 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 I give you one example. We, we were introducing this year a um, new, newly designed uh, public transport ticket 
uh, that is valid all over Germany. It's one ticket, valid all over Germany. And uh, the idea was to introduce it only as a digital ticket, only. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, it's a great idea. In Germany, you have like 50-something uh, public transport systems, and nobody knows wh what to do where. where and this, this ticket is a, is a huge convenient convenience for, for the citizens. But there was a, there was a large discussion. Uh, is, it, is it legitimate for the state to do it digitally because of data protection, because of uh, yeah, people who do not have uh, a smartphone, um, you do not need necessarily your smartphone. You need only a computer, but uh, doesn't mind. But but it is it is one example that we had this discussion. Now we introduced it, and people get used to it, and they say it's a great idea, and they want it to be continued, and so forth. So the data protection, um, in my view, it's important. It's a principle. It's it's very dear to the hearts. You have to break it down to a very concrete um, purpose. And, and when people see that the data they are providing at the end um, lead to better services and gives them a benefit in their daily lives, they are, also, they, they are more than willing to do so. Um, but it's a struggle. And the second struggle, I don't know if I have so much time left. No, OK. It's just that we have, like India, we have so many layers of government. And, but I will dwell into this in another, in another context. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gredel. That's um, a, a whole nother session. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you want to talk about federalism in Germany, stick around. Um, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, a question uh, to you, Valeria. Um, Ukraine has developed uh, an app, uh, a state in a smartphone, known as DIA, where citizens can carry, I think it's around 14, or maybe it's more by now, digital documents like their driver's license or their passport on their phone. Um, this, to some people living in some countries, is uh, uh, quite remarkable. Um, how did DIA become a trusted solution used by already half of the Ukrainian population? Uh, thank you, Chris, for this great question. So you all know that Ukraine has been called a European digital transformation tiger, and Ukraine is also the first country in the world where digital passports are totally equivalent to paper or plastic ones. Ministry of Digital Transformation in Ukraine is the newest ministry in the Ukrainian government. We are only four years old, and we have a rare opportunity to bring new approaches, build and implement bold vision, and deliver concrete products and services like DIA. So first of all, we have a great vision. We want to build the most convenient digital state in the world and in order to achieve that we have created an ecosystem of digital projects which is called DIA which has five projects the first one is our state super app which is used by 19.5 million users and this state super app combines 14 digital documents um, around 30 services and digital uh, signature so even before the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine Ukrainians have been able to pay fines or to pay taxes through DIA and when the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine started, we've been able to launch new services just from three days to a few weeks in order to respond to those uh, challenges that we've seen on the market. So just to give you several examples, when Russian missiles started to hit residential area, people started to go to shelters and they did not have any access to news. And that's how and why we embedded TV and radio into the DIA app. Then a lot of people had to relocate from their regions to another regions inside the country. And we have created a service in DIA that gave a possibility to receive um, a, a status of internally displaced person. And later, those people with the IDP status could receive a direct social financial assistance also through DIA. Another great example, which relates a lot to the topic of our today's session, a trust, it's a service which is called e-recovery. So this is the possibility on the first stage to receive a compensation from state for damaged or destroyed property because of a full-scale Russian aggression to Ukraine. Uh, and the second stage is basically the possibility to deny your property rights online and receive a certificate for a new property also also online. So this is um, a very complex service, not just from the technical side, uh, but from also from the side of the trust. So this is just a DIA state super app is just one project of our DIA ecosystem, which also includes state portal of public services DIA, where we have all of the services um, 
the, the majority of services digitized and we plan to have all of the services digitized in a year and basically uh, we have the fastest business registration in the world so you can register your business online in ukraine only for 10 minutes dia uh, city which is a special economic and tax regime for it industry dia business a separate project for the development of smes and dia education a national edutainment platform for reskilling and digital digital literacy because if you are building the most convenient digital state in the world people have to have at least basic level of digital skills to have an opportunity to use services and benefits which state is creating for them so dia state super app today is a love mark because basically we had um, uh, a lot of communication before launching this ecosystem and launching this app and explaining our citizens what is digital transformation and why it is important uh, for every uh, citizen so we also so, for example, count the effect of anti-corruption and transparency from digital transformation every year, and we also communicate about this to our uh, citizens. Also, we are engaging citizens into the process of the development of the new services and basically of better testing of every new service. So I think um, the, the probably most important thing about um, creating uh, DIA uh, as a love mark is not just uh, the user-centric and human-centric product that completely changes the way how government cooperates with citizens. But it's also a regular communication with citizens and uh, explaining uh, all of the benefits that citizens uh, could receive from, uh, from digital transformation. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria, for elaborating on DIA and how it is um, a tool for very direct communication also um, with citizens in addition to offering them services and documents. Um, before uh, coming to Luana, I would just like to remind the online audience that the chat is open. You are able to post your questions in there anytime. Uh, we have um, two more questions and then we will be opening up to a Q&A. And now over to you, uh, Luana. Brazil's digital government strategy emphasizes several key principles in building trust and confidence in digital public services. One of these principles uh, that jumped out at me when, when reading this is citizen centricity. Can you elaborate on why you think this is central to making the digital transformation of government a success? Yes, sure. I can also share some of the initiatives that we've been conducting on this subject. And uh, uh, that's that's true. The, the citizen centricity is definitely a core value to Brazilian digital government strategy, which was uh, uh, elaborated based on international uh, experiences and also OECD recommendations. And we believe that it is about offering an easy and simple way for people to interact with government and also providing high quality digital services. Uh, Brazil is a very diverse country and we need to fit to different backgrounds, to different uh, digital skills. And uh, this discussion is also connected to digital inclusion and also leaving no one behind, which is also a very dear value to our government. And to respond properly to all these necessities, we seek to be continuously hearing from uh, the citizens. We have been conducting several uh, user research projects to map the main difficulties that people have in those digital interactions to evolve our main solutions. And we've been uh, hearing more than 3,000 people in we have conducted more than 150 uh, projects so far. And as a result, we have developed some initiatives. We have learned a lot about the main difficulties that people, that people face. And those initiatives also work as platform as well. And uh, some of them are not technological ones, but they, they help to ease the, the journey for people. And for example, we have worked hardly to promote the use of plain and simple language in digital tools because we learned that uh, many difficulties people face are related to communication and not necessarily to technological tools. We also defined a design system because it helps a lot the visual uh, communication and it presents the interface standards so that people can have a feeling of unique experience in interaction in interacting with uh, government systems. We also launched a quality lab, lab and a quality model that creates standards to support digital service improvement and evolution. 
and also uh, uh, we provide an API for citizen feedback, uh, satisfa satisfaction assessment, and user and other user research initiatives. And uh, there is also uh, finally uh, a tool that we developed that is called Velibras, uh, which automatically translates the web page content to sign language. And Velibras makes more than 100,000 translations daily in our governmental web pages. And uh, we are also uh, working to provide tools to provide more uh, self-services and, and personalized service and more proactive initiatives as well. And I think that all these initiatives have been, uh, uh, have been able to improve inclusion, accessibility, and also the quality of digital services that the uh, federal government now provides in Brazil. Wow, Luana, thank you very much. We've covered a lot of ground in this question uh, round, everything from building capacity at different levels of government to the importance of digital skills and meeting them where they are, which is often on their smartphone in many places, while not uh, ignoring the question of inclusion and the topic of leave no one behind and accessibility, and of course, the importance of gaining the acceptance of citizenry also through clearly communicating how their data will be used um, it, when we ask for their data as governments. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you um, to the panelists. Before we open it up for Q&A, and I hope everyone here in the room um, is already thinking of a question or two that they can ask. Uh, we will only have time for one per person. Um, a final question now, looking to the future. Connected data sets, together with advanced analytics, open up new opportunities now to offer proactive digital public services, for example, based on life events. At the same time, the use of AI in public administration leads to the fact that citizens might find themselves confronted with a decision that was made by an algorithm and not a human. So now my question to the panel, again, um, and this time we'll go in reverse order, is how can trust be built and maintained in an age where AI is increasingly embedded in public administrations? Um, and I'd kindly ask you to limit your answer to two minutes per person so that we can get uh, some questions from the online and offline audience. Duana, floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we believe that there are some necessary actions that should be taken in order to build a trustable uh, context, environment, in process in uh, which AI is used in public administration. I would like to comment on four of them. Regarding transparency, we are convinced that uh, users need to know when AI is being used and how it is worked, it, how it is working. And uh, we know that this is a challenge. It's not always easy to explain and to understand how the results are generated. But we understand that it is necessary uh, that we make efforts to enhance transparency and to communicate properly how uh, AI is working. Secondly, uh, we know that AI decisions may carry cultural information that can lead to discrimination, biases, and prejudice. Then, when controls fail, uh, users affected by the decisions must have the right to request re review of the solution provided by AI. Thirdly, uh, with the use of a lot of data combined for AI learning, uh, uh, they become much more attractive to hackers and data leaks. Then we also believe that it is necessary to invest in privacy and security controls to, mitiga to mitigate risks and, and avoid threats. And finally, and uh, uh, we believe it's also important that each institution establishes adequate governance, which includes risk analysis, constant review of algorithms, analysis of data quality, and et cetera, to guide the actions that will prevent problems related to the use of AI and also the data misuse. Luana, thank you very much. And with that, straight over to you, Valeria, AI uh, and trust in public administration. Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. So again, building trust is a really complex and long-term process. And however, when it comes to AI, it is important to balance between regulation and innovation. So addressing specifically the topic of AI, 
between the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine have just recently presented the roadmap of AI regulation in Ukraine. So according to this roadmap, Ukrainian companies will cooperate with the international partners thanks to a legal regime identical to the EU. We will adopt a law similar to the European AI Act, and this will allow us to create identical legal regimes with the EU in the field of of AI, simplify cooperation with European partners and attract investments. We will also provide businesses with tools to prepare for future AI regulation, from assessing the impact of technology on human rights to signing voluntary codes of conduct. We will also publish recommendations to answer questions about what to do right now and what to expect in the future. And of course, a safe digital environment where human rights are protected will in the digital space uh, will be also created. Thank you. Very to the point. Thank you very much, um, Valeria. Dr. Griedel, how can trust be built and maintained in an age where AI is um, used in public administration? No, it's better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, shall I restart or no? Okay. Um, so, so what what we want to so what we are doing is um, putting for the time being always a human um, at the end of the decision process. Um, that is something that um, that gives trust. Actually, it's a psychological trust because, uh, as we all know, <laughs> AI sometimes is more reliable and, and more precise in decision making. But uh, we need to be, as a state, as a government, um, we, we need to take everybody on board. So that, that is something that we are planning to do. And I hope that uh, it, it helps us to create this, this dearly needed trust because on the other hand, there's another aspect of trust. It's not the trust of the citizens, it's the trust of the civil servants that are dealing with, with these um, processes and that are now owners of the processes and that needs, need to be taken on board also into this process. And I think for them also, um, if, they w if we want to, uh, to create a holistic, AI-driven government, it's important to, to have the civil servants on board and so to give them or to empower them to, to give the decision also or to be the last, last ones in the decision uh, line. Thank you very much for raising those two important aspects, human in the loop and trust also of uh, civil servants and not only the citizens in the end. Um, to round off this um, round, uh, Gautam, can I ask you to share your perspective, please? Absolutely. So I will reinforce what's already been said. We also believe in the importance of ensuring there are humans in the loop. While government systems are being rule-bound, tend to be very translatable to AI, it's still very important for citizens and for the government uh, employees themselves to have the comfort that there are human beings who are reviewing this, that there is an element of humani uh, humanity that's actually going into the decision-making processes. Um, it's not necessarily going to be uh, more efficient to do this, but it's going to be more trustworthy. And I think that's more important to in the short run. Over time, we also need to build in robust feedback and grievance loops. Uh, this is something that Luana also mentioned. I think it's important for people to know when AI is being used to actually be able to raise grievance in systems where uh, AI system has not given a good answer. Uh, beyond that, I think we need to look at a few opportunities that AI presents, right? So for a country the size of India, the range of contexts in which we work, the types of languages in which we work, it's important, AI can help ensure translation. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas that we as India are definitely exploring is the usage of AI to 
speak across multiple languages. So someone in the North speaking in a language called Punjabi could actually be serviced by a uh, operator working in a state in the South in a language called Malayalam, and they could have a conversation with each other in a language they're comfortable with. That's a low hanging fruit. I think the second element that we are really going to be focusing on is thinking about how do you listen at scale? So when you have to deal with 1.4 billion citizens, AI can help you really start making sense of a lot of inputs that can come in because it can help you listen through voice, it can help you listen through text, and it can help you make sense of that in a common across multiple languages and then distill what the population is saying so that the government can take those as policy inputs. Uh, so these two areas are very important. And third, that will actually start coming up is the ability for AI to be a co-pilot, not just to citizens, but also to field employees. So for example, if a medical worker is going on the field, uh, ensuring that certain uh, medical protocols, like for example, newborn babies have their born, they need multiple checkups, they need vaccinations. So the AI system should be able to work as a co-pilot with the medical worker and the parent as they're talking to each other saying, hey, you should also ask these questions. You should be tracking this data. Maybe you need to recommend one additional medication. And it's a recommendation that the human reviews and then, then carries out. So I think uh, being able to speak across languages, being able to hear at scale, and then acting as a co-pilot to field forces is a really important space where AI can come in. But again, subject to human uh, control, not controlling humans. Thank you. Nice finishing statement, uh, Gautam. Thank you very much. Um, I would try to summarize briefly what we what we heard. Uh, a lot of the similar themes uh, were hit uh, in this round. We had the issue of transparency, uh, knowing when AI is being used in uh, decisions in government uh, services, bias and discrimination and inclusion. Um, I really like the point of um, social listening, also to be able to use these tools to engage even more deeply and perhaps more broadly with uh, citizenry uh, and take that um, up as a government and the fact that it's a process. Start small, experiment, don't overwhelm citizens, don't overwhelm civil servants as essential aspects in building trust. Thank you all very much. Um, now, we lead to the discussion part of this roundtable discussion, and um, we open it to the audience. We want to hear from you. We'd like to hear from everyone here in this room who has a question, also the online audience. Again, the reminder, please pose a question into the chat, uh, and depending on time, we will uh, pick it up. We also have a runner here somewhere in the room with um, a microphone, please raise your hand and we'll see if we have any questions. I think I see a hand back here. Do we have um, a mic? No, okay, then we have a physical mic. Please briefly state your name and um, your uh -oh. question. Yeah, thank you for the all the thank you for the speakers. That was a uh, so interesting session. Uh, my name is Kohei. I'm running the Privacy by Design Lab. It's a uh, general purpose of the organizations. Uh, I'm personally the curious to some of the speakers that said like to protect the personal information, personal data, and designing of the privacy into the practice. I'm so curious as to how do you make a practical approach, just like to make a programs for the citizens to be aware, the increased advocates of the privacy, the data protections, because uh, this is a very granular concept. It's very hard to define a single approach for the privacy and data protection. Is there anything that you work on a more practical program to help the citizen to understand of these kind of the very important concept and helping them to be a trusted of the public service to access through the internet? So yeah, that's very helpful if you have any idea how to achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the key word is demystifying data protection and data privacy and how to explain this uh, for um, two citizens. Um, we um, can take perhaps one more question um, and then we can let our um, panel respond. I see a question over here. Um, I don't believe we have a lot of questions. Um, did we have um, a mic? Yeah. 
Yes, hello. My name is Rita from the New Club of Paris. Um, I have a question about the digital inclusion or exclusion. We have, con we have here four countries. And if you're not a citizen in the country, you may be excluded from the services because you don't have the personal identifier. And that's, mm -hmm. for instance, in, if you don't have an Ada Nama in India, you're bad luck. And I wonder in, in, uh, in, um, in Ukraine or in uh, Sweden or in any other country, if you don't have that digital ID number, you are not a citizen of that country, you cannot receive any services. And I, th I think this applies both for so in an increasingly global world, it uh, excludes migrants, but also um, um, expats and workers who work in different countries. So I think this uh, um, digital public services are very often exclusive services. How would you uh, address those questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I would suggest we, we throw this uh, back to our panelists before taking any more uh, to, to not have too many topics on here because they're all quite big uh, um, in themselves. So we had the question of practical ways of showing um, how governments are dealing with data protection privacy, what it means, and um, inclusion of non-citizens. Um, do any of the panelists feel like they want to speak to either of these questions? Uh, I see Valeria's hand up. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, if I may, thank you so much for these great questions. So I'll I'll start with the first one and give you an example of DIA and what we are doing. So for example, for DIA, we use the approach, DIA does not store any personal data. DIA uses the approach data in transit, which means, uh, which means that DIA connects directly to the state registers and shows the data which, which is needed. That's like the first answer um, to highly secured state registers, a very important remark. Uh, second remark, um, the next thing is that, remember I told uh, that it is very important, um, a regular communication from government to citizens, right? About uh, what digital transformation is, uh, what is the, uh, what are digital services, why digital literacy is important, what is privacy and so on. So, uh, uh, citizens should understand that government already have their data. The question is how government uses this data, right? So, for example, when citizens will understand who and when checks their data in the registry and receive notifications, it is about respect for this data, about avoiding the misusage of this data. Citizens' data belong to citizens and they have to know it. For example, we in the Ministry of Digital Transformation, we are also in the process of launching such push notifications for all registries. But the first stage, which we already done, was notifications about the revision for all the credit history in DIA. So, for example, if someone checks your credit history or opens a loan, you get notified in DIA. So you open the notification, go to the link to the Ukrainian Credit History Bureau, and you can react quickly. And the same notification will come if you get a card with a credit, credit limit or open a loan. So so um, th there is like, you know, as you, you mentioned very correctly, it's not a simple topic. It's a very complex topic. On the one hand, you have to work with the prevention. You have to do a lot of communication. You have to launch big projects on digital literacy. You have to make digital literacy available for everyone, not only for those people who have the uh, gadgets and internet connection, but also for people of elegant age or people who are for some reason like excluded and have no internet connection or no gadgets at home. You have to create opportunity for them like going to some special places like in ukraine we have digital hubs with facilitators who can facilitate the first contact for the people with with the gadget and you know and platform and so on another thing is basically to explain those the, those things and the third uh, thing is technical architecture right so how your technical products are built and um how do you uh, basically notify people about using their data. Another good question was about the digital uh, exclusion. Uh, well, in Ukraine, for example, we still have uh, offline centers of public services. So if people don't want to use digital services, they still can go and use them offline. But the thing is that, and basically what, uh, what revolution made DIA in Ukraine, DIA made digital transformation like a pop culture. DIA is a love mark. We have shown that basically the communication with the government could be as simple as communication with such startups as Uber, as Bolt, as Airbnb or Booking. Two clicks, 
and everything is done. So you don't need to stay in lines for four hours. You don't need to waste your time, waste your money. You, you have to leave and the less government people have in their lives, the better. And that's what Ukrainians already understood. And that's why and how we still can continue and we continue to build new and new digital products and digital services. So uh, anyway, it, it is not, uh, you know, uh, um, it is not obligatory to use DIA. It's just the will of people to make their life lives easier. So you still have both options. Thank you. Thank you, for Valeria, for bringing in the point that uh, we also need to uh, have offline ways to access these services, of course, for the people who don't want to or can't uh, access them online for some reason. Um, do any of the other speakers want to pick up on this point, or should we open for another round of questions? Luana, please. I can quickly uh, try to react also to the, the questions on the first one. We also don't storage data. It's basically uh, a, a way to interact, to in make the, the different data sets that we have interoper interoperable. And uh, what we do in concerning data protection and privacy is that we have been uh, working a lot to prepare and to, to strengthen resiliency and the capacity of different uh, public uh, uh, institutions so that they can uh, safeguard and can protect the data that they already have and may they, they may storage in their data sets and all the, the systems that they have and also to communicate better so that people can understand and also uh, have all the precautions necessary in, in, uh, in, our, our, in their data. And on the exclusion, uh, in case of Brazil, we have actually a number for foreigners who live in Brazil. They can have the, the identification if they live there so they, they can access the, the, the digital and also the physical services that are provided. And in some cases, such as the public uh, health system, even if they don't have the, the, the number and even if some person arrives without any document or anything, they are allowed to, to be served and, and uh, be attended in these situations. And we also have in some units, some agencies that can provide uh, the physical uh, uh, response to people who deserve and demand uh, the public services. Thank you very much, uh, Luana. I would like to pick up on that keyword of inclusion and also include our online audience. Uh, here we have a question. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over to uh, the online moderator, Sasha, my colleague, uh, to please share the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so of course, we also appreciate questions by our participants online. Um, and we do have a question to the panel on cybersecurity and its relevance for trust in digital government services. I believe some of it has been covered already by our panel. However, the question would be in how far cybersecurity matters in your experience, considering all the aspects discussed today already, such as user friendliness, ease of access, reliability, and so on. Thank you, Sasha. The question of cybersecurity, the um, digital elephant in the room that uh, has not been uh, addressed explicitly, perhaps. Um, we um, will take one more question, and this unfortunately will then also be the last question. I see a question over there, and there's a microphone uh, right there by chance. So, uh, Franz, please. Uh, so, I have, in a way, a related question to cybersecurity. You asked previously uh, what, uh, how to deal with trust in the age of AI. I asked how to deal with uh, trust in the age of cloud computing in the context that um, most governmental services are moving to the cloud and most countries rely on foreign cloud infrastructures, be it Huawei, be it AWS, be it uh, uh, Azure or whatever. Um, so only two countries in the world kind of are having their own domestic also cloud also operators, also operators and the rest rely on foreign the rest rely on foreign uh, cloud operators and uh, our partner governments in Africa are quite concerned about the digital sovereignty of their uh, public services uh, running on foreign cloud infrastructure thank you very much I think we have uh, was there one question um, Final question back there. Um, I see it's a, it's a burning question, and then the other two we'll, we'll, we'll put together. Um, okay, please, yeah. uh, please be brief. 
Yeah, so I'm the I'm Glindel. I'm from the Philippines. So since AI gives feedback from the information it sees, gathers, and analyzes from the cloud or internet, how do we prevent AI from divulging critical information from our systems, databases, and websites? And what limits AI in giving in what it must just give publicly and be cautious in giving information that needs to be kept private? That's it. Okay, that sounds like a whole nother session uh, in and of itself. Thank you for the question. We now have um, approximately four minutes remaining, and therefore I would uh, like uh, one or two panelists to pick up on the issue of cybersecurity and cloud computing, um, and perhaps another comment on the question of AI. How do we ensure it doesn't go uh, spilling all our uh, governmental secrets and the secrets of all our citizens? Dr. Brito, please. Very briefly on the issue of cloud and cybersecurity, um, that, that, that's a very relevant issue. And as German government, we are very intensively, is it still in, uh, on, off, yeah? Um, is, uh, we are working uh, on, on, on a two-track solution, uh, either building our own um, like federal German cloud, which is perhaps feasible for some very dedicated services, but also we are working with uh, international cloud providers on um, trying to modify their cloud systems in a way that they will be um, sovereign clouds for, for Germany. So um, we, are, we are discussing, we, we will see where we, where we will get, but that's very important. And the same goes for the cybersecurity, of course. Um, everything that we are doing in our, in our uh, state system, we are doing it inside a very highly protected uh, cybersecurity um, uh, enforced system. That is that I think that is not the challenge. The challenge is to do it user friendly and cyber secure. Thank you very much for this perspective. Looking to our online speakers, uh, the questions of cybersecurity uh, and cloud computing um, and AI. Anything to add briefly before we wrap up the session? Okay. Oh, uh, oh, I see the hands up. Sorry, I was looking for physical hands, and there are the virtual hands right in front of us. Okay, then uh, Gotam, uh, to, over to you, please. So on cloud computing, pretty much what Germany is doing, the similar approaches that India is adopting. I'll just add one additional piece on cloud. I think what we can uh, we see is this preference for if the server is in my room, it cannot be hacked which is a bit of re-education that often organizations like us have to do with uh, folks who are coming into the, into the space. But I think the other element then comes back to the costs of actually maintaining that kind of infrastructure when you kind of run that against the cost of working off the cloud. Uh, a lot of times the government officers then quite quickly understand that it's much better for me to use this as a service rather than to actually build out an entire new team and distract my own attention and my resources on this. On the piece about privacy, I think, and cybersecurity, I think all the points that have been said so far, I completely agree with. But uh, primarily, I think uh, one element on cybersecurity that keeps happening with government systems is uh, communication. When you do have breaches, or if you don't have, if you've dealt with breaches well, keeping people informed, keeping them informed in a way that builds trust is more important than saying it didn't get breached. Uh, Sometimes we also have to train people up front because some of the breaches are not because people hacked in, but because somebody inadvertently released data, right? And that kind of uh, capacity building is, uh, it's very, in our minds, uh, when we think of like, oh, people are hacking in from the way, this is actually the low grade capacity building, but it's the foundations of cybersecurity. So about 60% of breaches happen not because somebody hacked your system, but because somebody released information inadvertently. Thank you very much, uh, Gautam, for, for raising that point. Um, Valeria, your hand is still up. Uh, I ask you to be brief uh, in your comments before we wrap up the session. I'll try to do it. I just wanted to give a, a small story. Uh, well, full, uh, um, a few months uh, before the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine, we've seen the increase in the cyber attacks to Ukraine. And at the same moment, we have been working on a new law, which should have uh, allowed us to transfer data into the cloud. So just a few weeks before the full-scale Russian invasion to Ukraine, this law was adopted, and we moved all the data uh, into cloud. And then when the full-scale Russian invasion started, just in a week, 
a Russian missile hit it, the data center physically. It destroyed the data center where we used to store backups. But our data was already in the cloud. So I'm just, I just would like to address the question that I, to our mind, there is a no unique solution to that. You always have to like balance. And uh, it does not mean that you don't need a data center or you have to store data only in cloud. Yes, so you have to balance. Uh, and the, the same um, comes uh, about uh, cooperation with different partners. We believe in golden triangle triangle. Government should work with private sector and civil society and find the best ways to cooperate for the mutual uh, mutual benefit, right? And um, about the cybersecurity, of course, we take it super seriously. And when it comes, for example, specifically to DIA ecosystem, we have our own red team who is working on a daily basis to find even minor vulnerabilities. Uh, we also conduct bug bounties twice a year and we do like plenty of other measures. So uh, cybersecurity is a, is a very big and very important topic. We take it super seriously and we would be really glad to share our insights maybe in the next uh, session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria. Um, Dear panelists, thank you for all your inputs, your contributions. Uh, thank you to the audience who is here. I'm sorry we could not take all your questions. It was a very good discussion. Um, feel free to, to hang around, float outside with, with us uh, later. We can continue the discussion. Um, and I wish you an insightful IGF 2023. Thank you.